Our scripture this morning is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I give unto you to be the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Behold, do men light, do men light a candle and put it under a bushel? Nay, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Therefore, let your light so shine before this world that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Well, there weren't half my congregation. <laughs> Thank you for the beautiful special music this morning. Appreciate that. In keeping with the theme this month of walking humbly before God, I recently found myself in a situation that required a humbling assessment of my own actions. Jesus tells us in Matthew twenty-two thirty-six 36 that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. All three of these aspects are of co-equal importance but they are listed separately and should be studied separately at some point to gain an appreciation of each. I'm going to focus on the mind in today's thoughts rather than try to tug at your heartstrings. Impacting the heart is perhaps a greater challenge. We're going to set our, our emotions aside for the moment. Don't worry, the heart will be key to our study at the last. A friend of mine passed away just before Christmas. We had been together in our writer's critique group, listening to and providing suggestions for each other's work. I drove to her visitation at a church in Gladstone, hoping to see some other writers who had also shared in our critique group. I was disappointed to find no one that I knew, and only a small handful of strangers talking among themselves near the casket. They made no attempt to speak to me, nor I to them, as I briefly paid my respects. I signed the guest book in the back on my way out before starting my return trip. Death has a way of affecting our innermost feelings, renewing our sense of mortality in the universe. I was lost in my own thoughts as I drove when I suddenly realized something something that screamed out at me. I am currently writing a novel about a gentleman in Victorian England who has been bitten by a werewolf. He decides that rather than succumb to the destructive condition this normally leads to, he will use his enhanced strength, hearing, sight, and sense of smell to become the world's finest private investigator. Naturally, he exists in both the time and location of that most famous of fictional detectives, the redoubtable Sherlock Holmes. I have been making a study of the great detective, seeking principles that may be used by my werewolf investigator. Because I've been thinking along these lines, I realized that I had departed the church with a great deal left undone. Had it been Sherlock Holmes in my shoes, it would have been child's play to simply glance up the page in that guest list to determine how many of my fellow writers had come to the visitation and left before I arrived. He would not have missed the opportunity to introduce himself to that small knot of family present, to learn more about this departed lady from their perspective while sharing the good memories he had from her company. In short, I would make a terrible detective. I am by nature an introvert. I draw my strength from internal contemplation. I have deep feelings, a sympathetic outlook. But in new situations, my typical reaction is to assess how the encounter is going to affect me. My focus is internal. 
Sherlock Holmes is famed for being able to gather the facts, lean back on his couch in his sitting room, and think his way to the solution. Although he spends much time alone, speaking rarely to others while he processes a case, and is generally considered an introvert, I believe people are misreading him. Holmes thrives on new and unusual facts and events in his cases, and he dreads the boredom that overwhelms him between his adventures. Holmes draws his strength from the things that he observes externally, and he harnesses his intellect to put the puzzle pieces in order. Sherlock Holmes is an extrovert who revels in the external stimulation of persons and events. Although Holmes has a reputation for being cold-blooded, he often took cases for no fee when the client was poor. In several cases, he showed mercy to the poor devils trying to escape a bad situation instead of turning them over to the police. If Sherlock Holmes had gone to the visitation for my friend, his actions, from his external point of view, would have uncovered a more complete picture of the deceased, how many visitors had arrived before him, and established a bond with the family that knew her best, leaving a positive impression on the family that night. For my part, even though I had true feelings of caring and sympathy for my friend and her family, my focus on my internal feelings paralyzed my ability to perceive external facts and beneficially act on them. It is I, the introvert, who spends most of my time evaluating my own feelings, who comes off as heartless. This realization forced me to consider my worldview in a larger context. It's bad enough if you blow up an opportunity to make a positive impact in an emotional setting like a funeral visitation. But we need to learn from our mistakes and use what we learn to change our future behavior. I know that I believe in the gospel and the restoration. I know that I can share that belief with others, pointing out scriptures, discussing the good news in the context of events sweeping our world today. I can be persuasive given the opportunity. And that's the catch, at least for me, given the opportunity. If I'm going to be effective in sharing my faith, I can't rely on being given the opportunity. I need to make opportunities. To do this, I can't withdraw into my introverted cocoon and think happy thoughts and wonder why no one around me sees the truth the way that I do. No one sees the truth the way I do because I'm not giving them the opportunity to see me. Introverts like me can learn to be more outgoing, to take more risks, it's not something that comes naturally for us. We have to make an effort. But that effort is in harmony with our deeply felt importance of the truths we wish to share. If we remain introverted in how we interact, we appear insensitive, and our message will fail if it gets out at all. But if we understand that we must adopt an extroverted style in order to connect, to share the love of Christ, then we can begin to become successful. Look, for example, to Acts 17, when Paul went to Mars Hill in Athens. He found himself surrounded by idols of every description. As a good Jew and as a Christian, he probably felt a great degree of revulsion at being in the presence of these pagan symbols. Rather than react to what he felt internally, however, Paul looked at his surroundings with an external detachment, viewing them as facts instead of foes. He used his brain to see beyond the figures of wood and stone to determine what the desires were of the makers and the worshipers. He deduced 
that they were aching for a higher power to fill that void in their hearts. And these idols expressed that need more clearly than a row of Burma shave signs. Verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom ye therefore ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. I would submit to you that we need to take an extroverted approach in our lives if we plan to be successful in spreading the gospel. While we sit inside these four walls, contemplating the Sunday message and the excellent classes, and enjoying a loving fellowship, we are not getting the word outside these walls. To do that, we must be explicitly extroverted in our approach. This is not to say that being an introvert is bad, or that being an extrovert is good. We were each created with our own special mixture of personalities, talents, and strengths. We are better off using all the gifts that God has placed in his people. It's just that a strong introvert tends to be more like a candle set under a bushel than a light standing on a hill. A candle under a bushel still shines, still gives light. But we need the wisdom to reflect on these things, detached from the straitjacket of our feelings. We need to see that the bright light hidden away needs to be brought out into the open and shared. We are called to be ambassadors for Christ. And he has given each of us a testimony that should burn brightly in our lives. Proverbs chapter 8 says, Does not wisdom cry? And understanding put forth her words. She standeth in the top of the high places, by the way in the places of the paths. She crieth at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming in at the doors. Wisdom is not intended to be hidden. It is meant to be broadcast, to be heard by as many as possible. We read these th things in our scriptures and our minds understand them. As always, however, the difference is between knowing what the right thing is to do and actually doing the right thing. We are mortal, born of Adam's blood, and we will stumble and fall. But we are also infused with the Holy Spirit, which can strengthen us, teach us, and lead us in the paths where we should walk. For many, that walk takes us often into thinking deeply within and about ourselves. That's where I was that night of the visitation, reflecting on death and life and my place in it. That's my bent, if you will. That's how I'm naturally wired. But then man has a natural tendency to sin, do we not? God calls us not to submit to our natural tendencies, but to submit to his will. That always involves a change in us. Often that change is uncomfortable. For me, I find that I need to learn some skills from the playbook of Sherlock Holmes. Holmes understood that if we allow our senses to run on autopilot, we miss important clues around us. As we soak in the warmth of a sunny day, the coolness of a gentle breeze, the bright colors of a patch of flowers, we let our attention focus on how these stimuli are affecting us personally. Our attention turns inward, and we miss seeing other external objects that may hold great importance. That's why Holmes forbids himself the luxury of allowing his senses to affect how he perceives things. The color of a flower becomes important only in identifying what type of flower it is. The breeze matters only in its direction and strength and whether it carries anything with it. It is of less value to know that the sun is shining than it is to know that it rained yesterday afternoon. 
Sherlock Holmes perceives the same things. He just perceives them differently because he sees them through the lens of solving a case. Holmes' good friend, Dr. Watson, sees them through the lens of how they affect him personally and what feelings they generate within his breast. I identify with Watson because that's how I typically react. Most of us probably identify with Watson. He reacts to the beauty around him. Instead of, seeking, instead of seeing a high brick wall, he rejoices in the details of a lichen-covered edifice with moss growing over the top. He is poetic, a romantic. He is not detached from his observations. He is swimming in them. Holmes sets aside preliminary judgments of what he encounters so that his mind is not taken up with sorting how everything is making him feel. That is something that will come later after the analysis complete and the proper action taken. He does not want his first impressions to mislead him, to color the ability to see the truth concerning the evidence. His lifelong practice of not seeking to feel when presented with new input allows him to be markedly more effective in determining what is really going on and what he can do to affect a better outcome. I know that sounds backwards to us as Christians. We are taught to value our feelings first, to seek and to share love with our fellow man. But perhaps we've missed something, misinterpreted a clue. Let's take a look at a well-known conversation in Matthew chapter 19, where Jesus is answering questions. In verse 16, Behold, one came and said, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter, wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things I have kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go, sell what thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Which method did Jesus use here in perceiving the young man? At first glance, this seems like an ideal opportunity to lovingly accept this man. He comes of his own accord to the master, asking for direction. He praises Jesus. He has kept the commandments. Yet Jesus shuts him down, crushes him publicly. Why? Our first clue is in how the young man addresses Jesus, good master. Jesus immediately picks up on this and replies, why callest thou me good? The young man is instantly identified as a flatterer. Not the best way to start off a discussion with the Son of God. Our second clue is in his question, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Is this guy naive or does this reflect his self-centered view of his own universe? Eternal life is not gained through our actions, but as the result of the actions of Christ and his Father. Our good works spring out of our salvation. They are not the cause of it. But Jesus plays along to test this young man on the terms he himself has set. Keep the commandments, he says. Which, the young man asks. If we didn't know before that this man was a phony, we do now. Really, you can pick and choose which commandments to keep? But Jesus keeps the young man on his hook, reeling off the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth commandments. Again, 
the young man stays his course. All these things I have kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? The young man's arrogance is outstanding, is astounding. You see, it's not that you can become perfect by keeping the commandments. It requires a perfect person to keep the commandments. The commandments are but a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, not to perfect us. Jesus knew that this man had not kept the commandments. He was guilty of bearing false witness. We'll talk about stealing in a moment, and his love of his neighbor will shortly be brought into question. Other facts known to Jesus here that are not recorded in the scripture may include how the young man was dressed, probably in rich robes, and how he spoke. Did his voice and manner display an upbringing in a wealthy household? These observations, not to mention that Jesus could see his thoughts and desires anyway, set the stage for Jesus to send an arrow straight to the heart of the matter. Jesus said to him, If thou wilt be perfect, go, sell what thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. The young man may have been deceiving himself, but he could not deceive Jesus. The man obviously liked his rich man's things, and his questions reflected an obsession with self. It is not a far reach to extend that obsession with selfish things to the area of his possessions. Jesus may have also responded here indirectly concerning one of the commandments that he did not list, the first. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The young man was obviously placing his love of possessions before his love of God. This also probably equates to stealing at some level, taking worship from God to lavish on gold. Note that Jesus corrects the young man's theology here as well. Thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. It is in following Christ that we achieve perfection. Jesus comes to the point, repent of your sin and follow me. The young man, faced with the uncompromising truth, leaves in sorrow, knowing that he treasures his things more than eternal life. Was this a compassionate conversation that Jesus held with the young man? I would say hardly. Jesus dealt strongly with the Pharisees and Sadducees when they lied. Lies are to be confronted, not excused. This is an act of dispassion, not compassion. Jesus focused on the facts of this young man as they were presented to him, not to the outward appearance of an upright young man seeking truth. Jesus suspended the impulse to react emotionally, for there was a secret to uncover and a lesson to be taught. When the prophet Samuel went to the home of Jesse to anoint a new king for Israel from among his sons, he learned clearly how God observes. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 6 and 7, And it came to pass, when they were come, they looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. We are defined in large part by our first impressions. It's hard to shake that initial assessment. For us to look on the heart, we must look further than the outward appearance. We must ask questions. We must watch behavior. We must discard things that are not relevant in seeing a man's heart. We must pray for guidance from the Holy Spirit. We must remain initially detached while we gather our facts and draw our conclusions. We cannot allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by the rush of emotions cementing a critical first impression that will freeze our discernment for good or ill. To do so puts us at risk to choose the wrong path, or at least a course that does not glorify God to the extent that it ought. 
There's a method of thinking called Six Thinking Hats, created by Edward de Bono. It is designed to guide groups or committees of people to work in concert through complex problem solving. The mind approaches thinking from several different directions. When we think at several different directions at the same time, it's easy to get confused and not think clearly. Six Thinking Hats splits how we think into six categories and it assigns each one the concept of a thinking hat, each one with its own color to identify them and help keep them separate. When we put on the hat, we are allowed only to use that type of thinking that that particular hat represents. This allows everyone to think and share with a common goal rather than at cross purposes. The white hat controls facts, dispassionate things that are true or false, things we can know for certain, neither positive nor negative. This is generally the first hat to use to, base, to build a base of common understanding. The yellow hat is brightness and optimism, used to explore all the good things that may result from a project or activity. The red hat controls emotion. It is important not to put this hat on too early in the discussions, but it is needed to reveal if someone has an agenda, has a bad feeling about something, doesn't trust a party involved. It covers hunches and intuition where there is feeling without facts. The green hat signifies creativity, possibilities, and new ideas. The black hat is caution and critical thinking. What could go wrong here? An essential hat to use, but use it sparingly. The blue hat is purely administrative to manage all the other hats in groups' meetings. For example, we've documented a number of facts while wearing the white hat. Now would everyone please put on your yellow hat and we'll explore this from an optimistic standpoint. Note that emotion is present in only one hat the red one. In all other areas of thinking, emotion is excluded. But in the final recommendation by Edward de Bono, he stresses that when the group has worn each hat, gathered the facts, applied critical thinking, explored creatively, when they are ready to make that final decision, it should be made wearing the red hat. Everyone should have a good feeling about making that decision after all the other thinking is over. It is the same with us as Christians. We must use our minds wisely, and as several examples have shown, somewhat dispassionately, in order to effectively perceive the opportunities to witness and impact others for the Lord. But at the end of the day, it is our hearts that must be true, or our words will fall flat. Yes, I am a bad detective. I am flawed. But I am a child of God, and he grants me the agency to choose to improve. There is knowledge and wisdom available to guide us in our interactions with others, and even in our interactions within ourselves. I encourage you to reflect on these thoughts. Search the scriptures. Don't just read them the same way you read them before. Study and explore the text to see if you missed anything the first 17 times through. It happens all the time in real life. I can't tell you how many times I've missed seeing that can of green beans on the pantry shelf hiding right there behind the corn. But it was there all the time waiting for me to discover it. I missed a golden opportunity to witness, to interact with people who shared a relationship with a good friend because I first retreated into my own feelings. As I mature as a Christian, I pray I will have the courage and foresight to bring my light out from underneath my bushel. It's the logical and ultimately the compassionate thing to do. May God bless you in your life's adventures.